Nuclear winter is a term that once belonged exclusively to the Cold War military lexicon. It has emerged from various theoretical assumptions and has become a grim possibility in the collective consciousness of the modern world. And so, at times, the question arises, can humanity survive the consequences of its own destructive capabilities? Today, we'll explore this question in depth, delving into the scientific consensus behind nuclear winter. The prolonged global climatic cooling, expected to occur as a result of widespread firestorms following a nuclear war, the impact of a large asteroid or massive volcanic eruptions. So, regardless of the scenario of a nuclear winter, the mechanism is simple. At the moment of maximum, everything will burn. Fuel supplies, homes, people, metal, and organic matter in the soil. First category of people. Those in the blast radius will disappear instantly. The second category, those who are outside the shockwave impact radius, will receive most of the gamma radiation and die within a few days. The third category, let's call them observers, run the risk that they may encounter radioactive phenomena in the form of rain, snow or dust in the near future, but they still have a much better chance of survival than the first two categories. Because such radiation has a relatively weak, penetrating power, so surviving houses, cellars and dugouts greatly reduce the risks to life. But you should not be happy. The struggle for life is just beginning because nuclear winter is coming. The most realistic computer modeling to date allows you to take into account the various factors that will affect the climate in the event of a global nuclear war. So the developers divided the atmosphere into small fragments two degrees of latitude by two degrees of longitude and the thickness of the atmospheric column divided into 66 layers. Then they took into account almost everything they could the reflectivity of land and water, chemical reactions occurring in the atmosphere, the contribution of humans and wildlife to carbon dioxide. Such a comprehensive model, of course, was not invented specifically to calculate a nuclear catastrophe it was created and verified by dozens of researchers in the course of normal climatological research. So it's worth mentioning that only this simulation will be taken into account throughout this issue. And now soot will be added to the computer model, 150 million tons to be exact. Exactly how much or even a little more combustion products will be released if two world powers, which is not difficult to guess, will drop their nuclear arsenals on each other. It is also important to consider that soot from volcanoes in the same explosion has less tragic consequences, but in this video we will only consider the consequences of people. If we are observers, we will see for days how, after the epicenter of the explosions, the combustion will produce fine dispersed soot. The rising currents of hot air will carry it into the stratosphere. There it will remain for a long time, because unlike in the lower atmosphere, there is no rain in the stratosphere, which would wash this soot down. Further, the soot particles will heat up and cool the surface of the Earth. The stratosphere will heat up but it will be heated by the heat that doesn't reach the surface. That heat will be re-radiated back into space. And the Earth, like its inhabitants, will remain in the shadows. Once sticking particles of soot will gradually fall into the lower atmosphere, from where they will be washed out by rain. But slowly, as particles of soot will have different sizes and will be arranged differently. They will stick together and break apart. Radiation with different wavelengths will be absorbed and scattered on them differently. All this is also taken into account in the simulation. The heated stratosphere will lead to a faster decay of ozone, which will slightly increase the permeability of the atmosphere to ultraviolet light. As a result, the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface in the first year of the new epoch will decrease by 67% on average across the Earth. Temperatures will drop by an average of 9 degrees, which would be an epochal agricultural horror thousands of kilometers away. But the model's predictions don't stop there. The warming of the stratosphere and the freezing of the Earth's surface and lower atmosphere will be followed by a decrease in atmospheric moisture and precipitation. A nuclear winter may contribute to a significant change in precipitation patterns, which could lead to prolonged droughts in some regions and heavy rains in others, 
further disrupting the surviving ecosystems. It would also disrupt agriculture and natural food production systems. Reduced light and lower surface temperatures will affect marine ecosystems, in particular phytoplankton, the basis of the marine food chain, which could lead to the collapse of fish stocks and negatively affect animals. Animal life will face serious problems due to food and water shortages, changes in habitat, and the potential inability to migrate and adapt quickly. Humans, on the other hand, who have miraculously survived, even with their sanity and ingenuity, will face enormous problems due to food shortages, social unrest, and the destruction of civilizations in general. There is no electricity, no internet, no water or food in the supermarkets. Everything has been destroyed or looted. You are lucky if you have managed to buy some supplies for the first time. This can be fuel for your car and generator, raw materials for heating and defense equipment. As for provisions, it's more complicated because you'll need to stock up for eight years. That's how long the most significant effects of a nuclear winter will last. And yes, it will be difficult to do it living in the center of the city in a one-room apartment. It would seem that a coordinated global response is needed to share resources and knowledge in such times. However, such cooperation may prove difficult and even fabulous in a post-nuclear conflict environment. In the end, of course, the survival of people, specifically small groups in such environments, depends on many factors, to name a few. What investments have been made in infrastructure for fallout protection and food security such as underground facilities? If so, some people will have a better chance of surviving the initial phase of a nuclear winter. Survival will also depend on the ability to produce food by alternative methods, such as indoor cultivation using grow lamps and hydroponics, and this requires alternative sources of heating, as traditional fuel sources may become scarce or inoperable. But survival in a nuclear winter will require not only physical but also psychological resilience, as people and communities will have to adapt to extreme conditions and prolonged isolation or confinement. In turn, this raises another issue such as the ethics of survival. This includes resource allocation, community dynamics, and potential conflicts over scarcity of basic necessities. All of this will be a major issue in a post-nuclear winter world. While on the one hand the possibility of population movement to less affected areas may mitigate some of the effects, on the other hand it may well lead to new conflicts over limited resources and safe places. Needless to say, there will soon be groups of people willing to do anything for profit. Definitely they will. The world will change with people. If you think that hunger, cold and dangerous rabble in the new wastelands is all there is to it, you're wrong. Given the modeling we've discussed above, the ozone layer will gradually become four times thinner. This will happen due to the stratosphere heating up and releasing into it. In addition to soot particles, nitrogen oxides, which cause the ozone to decay into ordinary oxygen. The result of this is an increase in the flux of UVB radiation on the Earth, and as a consequence, an increase in the risk of DNA damage by a factor of 2.5. This will lead to an increase in skin cancer incidence of up to 30% within a few years. Which means the best option is to migrate away as a matter of urgency. Will there be any places left on Earth where it is safe to live and farm, herd and fish, Yes, these places are very far from the epicenter thousands of kilometers away, and in some cases islands or even continents. Fortunately, nuclear winter remains a theoretical extreme, but human ingenuity and foresight could be the decisive elements between both annihilation and the chance to recover from such a cataclysmic event. While survival is theoretically possible, it will require unprecedented levels of preparedness, adaptation and international cooperation or at least humanity.